Okay, welcome back to our lecture on what's the current slide. Our lecture on form, but and now we're talking about texture. And we were we ended with just a little bit of a comparison between these two works of art. And I was talking a little bit about uh, Jeff Koons's piece. And so, but the other thing I want to say is that texture is also an important part, texture and surface, important part for two-dimensional works, especially uh, paintings. And sometimes paintings can have a lot of really physically built up texture, such as these two uh, paintings by uh, Gerhard Richter right here. But then also sometimes they can have almost no surface. This painting by Richter is extremely flat, like a kind of a smooth glass-like surface. And any of the sense of texture is really an illusion of texture of the stuff inside the painting, not of the painting itself. Which leads to another topic that I want to cover, which is the idea of visual textures and simulated textures and what the difference are between those things. Um, so simulated textures, well, let's start with visual textures. Visual textures are any kind of sense, illusion of texture that is created on a two-dimensional surface purely by just the two-dimensional mark making, not actually creating a physical texture, but just creating a sense of texture just by mark making. Simulated textures are where in a two-dimensional surface, right, you're creating a a visual texture that simulates, that looks just like an actual physical texture that we know of in the real world, right? So to give an example, like these are visual textures, like this one and this one. They may kind of suggest actual real world te textures, but they're too stylized to really fool us into believing in them as, as simulated textures. Whereas these here, right? or this here. These are not only visual textures, but they're simulated textures and they're creating like the illusion of an actual physical texture that we may know of from real life. So that's the main difference. And one of the reasons why I'm going over this is because don't forget in unit three on your uh, design sketch assignment, one of the things you have to do is you have to create various kinds of visual textures. Okay. So the last part of this lecture is a discussion of dynamics. And so, um, and dynamics relates both to sculpture and to other works, but we're going to really kind of keep it mostly focused on sculpture because that's what brought us into it. The reason why we're talking about dynamics now is because of that transition from Hellenic sculpture to Hellenistic sculpture is a really kind of classic moment in our history where, um, artists start to really embrace really kind of extreme actions and movements and dynamic tensions in works of, of sculpture and try to represent anguish and, and extreme emotions in works of sculpture. And so because of that, I think this is a good time for us to talk about what we mean when we say dynamics. Uh, so here are some two classic examples. So we already saw the Luakuan group right? A Hellenistic work of sculpture. And here is a Baroque work of sculpture uh, by Bernini. Um, yeah, I know I'm mostly picking Bernini, uh, but I am a big fan, uh, where also has a lot of the same kind of feeling. And in both cases, these are uh, sculptures where there are multiple, multiple figures and they're in an act of struggling. It's kind of, it's a sort of semi-violent kind of pose. Um, it's interesting that they're both kind of like slightly sensuous and kind of violent at the same time. I don't know what you want to make of that about Hellenistic Greeks and Baroque Europeans, but make of it what you will. Um, but before we get too much further into talking about it on the three-dimensional side, we need to talk a little bit about it on the two-dimensional side, because the first thing we have to consider is how, how do shapes, how do, how do we create illusions of movement in a composition. So I want you to think about like what kinds of shapes create movement generally. And here are some, some general tendency rules, right? Shapes that have that point, that have a sense of pointing in one direction as opposed to others. So like triangles, especially elongated triangles, um, tend to have more movement. Like equilateral triangles have less movement because they point in all three directions equally. Circles have even less movement still because they don't point in any direction, whereas a stretched out triangle 
has a lot of movement, but a lot of it also has to do with the arrangement, the grouping of these triangles. I think probably, you know, kind of curved pointed arcs probably might have the most movement potential just as a simple shape. But another thing I want to point out here is that even when we have shapes that themselves don't have a lot of potential movement, how you treat the shape, right, how you change it with texture and mark can create a lot of potential sense of movement as well, right? And then, but the other thing I want you to think about with this image here is that dynamics are not just about movement, they're about strain, right, and constraint. So they're about movements that are paired against each other. They might, and especially that's really important in sculpture because the thing about a work of sculpture is no matter, well, except for uh, like a mobile sculpture, generally works of sculpture can't move. So if they're going to represent something that's dramatic and has a lot of movement, it can't actually be a movement. It needs to be a, a moment where two movements come to a standstill, right? Two things are straining against each other, and those two potential energies are pushing against each other. And then that that stillness represents energy and movement, even without any actual movement happening. Another thing I want you to think about is how even when you have shapes that don't themselves have a lot of movement, right? We talked about equilateral triangles not having a lot of particular movement. Squares don't have a lot of particular movement, but the way you arrange them can create a lot of movement as well. So let's talk about dynamic forces in painting, right? Um, and so we have a lot of movement through repetition of shape, right? If we for a moment forget about the fact that there are there's the illusion of people and a raft and waves here. I said I'll be talking about the raft and Medusa many times. If we forget about all that for a second, right, and we just kind of see it as a grouping of light and dark shapes, then what we will notice is that we that it is a lot of repetition of similar shapes over and over again. Like notice this, this, this as this kind of repetition, right? And like other kind of shapes that are quite similar to each other occurring over and over again and kind of like lining up with each other. That has a tendency to create a lot of movement. And then there's a lot of, one of the things that creates a lot of kind of dynamic tension in this painting is the straining between this kind of undulating movement of the figures versus the hard geometric organization of the, the two main triangles of the composition. We'll talk about that at another lecture. Here's some examples of movement in photography. We can create movement in photography through repetition, just like we talked about, like in this case, in a time-lapse way. It's a famous uh, Thomas Aikens photograph. Or um, we can create movement through composition, like see how this repetition of these lines over and over again helps support that overall curved arc, right? Remember how I said like uh, kind of pointed arcs have a lot of movement and then how that creates all this movement pushing that that bicycle and that bicyclist. Now, of course, also a lot of it has to do with the blur that's there. That's something that I don't think painters quite understood until after the invention of photography. Okay, so let's get back to sculpture. So if you can think about like what we talked about, we see sense of movement created through repetition of shapes, right? Through repetition of marks of, of lines and shapes, right? We see but we also see the fact that these movements are kind of counterbalanced, right? And they push against each other and they reach to a moment of strain, but stillness, right? So that these sculptures create the sense of like all this potential movement and all this struggle and all this constraint, but at the same time, they don't feel, all right, that's my one minute mark. So I only have like a minute left, which is okay. Cause I think this is my last slide. Yeah, it is. So the last thing I wanted to say is that we're going to, when we get to the Baroque period, I want you to remember what we were talking about here because dynamics and especially the, the tension between geometric compositions and the undulated dynamics, a movement of figures, and the way those two kind of push against each other is such a major part of the way uh, Baroque art, um, Baroque painting and Baroque sculpture is put together. It's all about these kind of dynamic energies and dynamic constraints um, and and a sense of, of drama created from that. Okay, all right, that's the end of the lecture. I will see you next when we talk about representation.